Hello researchers and extracellular vesicle enthusiasts. Welcome to the latest particle metrics webinar on nanoparticle tracking. My name is Dr. Sven Kreutel and I'm working for particle metrics as sales director. Today we address the important question on how important it is to know what's in your sample and how we phenotype extracellular vesicles with fluorescence nanoparticle tracking analysis. It is well known that almost all cell types release many different kinds of biological nanoparticles. You can find apoptotic bodies, protein aggregates, microvesicles, exosomes and many other particles in all kinds of body fluid. Exosomes are the smallest of the currently known EVs with a size range between 30 and 100 nanometer. They are involved in a huge variety of physiological processes such as cell-to-cell -cell communication, inflammatory processes or metastasis of tumors. However, the existence of cellular vesicles is not limited to eukaryotic organisms and can be found in all kingdoms of life. As early as 2014, the ISAF community published guidelines on the minimum information required for the characterization of extracellular vesicles. These guidelines have been recently updated. Here the authors describe requirements and experimental controls which must be conducted for a proper EV analysis. Part of the work that needs to be done is a comprehensive quantification analysis of the particles in the sample, a characterization of the protein composition and the existence of surface markers typical for the investigated vesicle type. Current state-of-the-art technologies for sizing and concentration measurements are microfluidic resistive pulse sensing, tunable resistive pulse sensing and scatter-based nanoparticle tracking analysis. However, these methods are pretty unspecific and not sufficient for a comprehensive EV characterization. They are missing information such as protein composition, the existence of surface markers and last but not least, the origin of the biological nanoparticle. On the other hand, methods like flow cytometry, ELISA-based assays and fluorescent-based nanoparticle tracking have been shown to be a proper tool for gaining specific information using selective antibodies. This is a representative video image of a scatter-based NTA result where a lot of people might wonder what type of particle do I see in my sample? Is this signal really an EV or an exosome? Or is it just a nanobubble, a protein aggregate or an unspecific inorganic salt precipitate? You simply do not know. But this is exactly how classical NTA works. All particles in a sample are illuminated by a laser. All particles scatter light, which is detected by the camera and analyzed. So all particles, no matter what they consist of, are part of the analysis. I hope you agree that it's not correct to plot a size histogram containing all those unknown particles and call this distribution my extracellular vesicle distribution. And more importantly, if you're only interested in the vesicles in your sample, using all these signals for calculating the concentration will result in an overestimation of the real vesicle count. And this is where fluorescence nanoparticle tracking becomes important. By applying a suitable fluorescence emission filter into the scatter light path of the zeta view optics, the user blocks all unspecific scatter light and only the Stokes shifted fluorescence emission light reaches the optical sensor. In this way, non fluorescent particles will not be detected and therefore are no longer part of the evaluation. By measuring and comparing the non-fluorescent and fluorescent data, concentration ratios can be calculated and the influence on the size distribution of the non-fluorescent particles will be eliminated. The easiest fluorescent staining is a membrane stain. There are thousands of lipid dyes available which integrate into the membrane and stain thereby any particle with a lipid membrane. These dyes have a lot of advantages. They are available for any laser color. They are bright. They are cheap and they are easy to use. This is an example of a lyophilized exosome standard from the colon cancer cell line HCT116, which have been stained with cell mass deep red. In gray, you can see the size distribution of the scatter channel, and in red, the result of the fluorescent channel is depicted. The data clearly show that we find 85% of all particles from the scatter mode in the fluorescent mode as well. This is a very good result, showing a very pure sample, but on the other hand it means that 15% of all particles has been rubbished. Furthermore, if you have a look on the peak size, you find it influenced by this 15%. At 
As I mentioned, this is a very pure exosome standard sample. You can imagine that the influence will be much higher in any other kind of sample. So we have a very good tool to improve our results with a membrane staining. But you might argue now that there can be any other kind of particles in your sample which have a membrane but are not considered to be an exosome. And of course, you are right. So if you want to work more specifically, you have to use antibodies. For exosome quantification, we routinely use a triple stain with the three exosomal membrane markers CD9, CD63 and CD81, all labeled with the same dye, in this case Alexa Fluor 488. We use the same HCT116 exosome standard as I showed you before. In green you see the result of the fluorescent channel, whereas in blue the results of the scatter is shown. This experiment has been performed four times individually. If we have a closer look on the concentration, you find roughly 65% of all particles from the scatter mode back in the fluorescent channel. Therefore, we can assume that 35% of the membranous particles present in this standard are no exosomes. If we have a look on the median size, you can see that the influence of this 35% of particles which are not of our interest have a great influence on the result. Taken together, I hope that you agree that if you want to have reliable size and concentration and TA results, you should be using a combination of scatter and fluorescent mode, and not just the scatter mode alone. In the last couple of years, we optimized our ZW instruments in terms of fluorescence. We added more lasers and more software-controlled filters, which makes the system currently to the most flexible NTA system in the world. In 2019, we introduced a hard and software feature which facilitates the use of fast bleaching fluorophores like FITC and fluorescein based dyes. Furthermore, we developed a unique quad system which can analyze up to five different channels on the same sample. While one channel is used for scatter mode, the other four could be used for fluorescence as we have four lasers integrated. A violet, a blue, a green, and a red laser offer the whole spectra of the visible fluorescent dyes. That helps you to characterize your particles very properly while saving time and sample volume. To show the maximum power of the particle matrix multilaser system, a fourfold fluorescent labeling with the unspecific membrane stained cell mass deep red and three monoclonal antibodies was performed. As expected for a commercially available EV product, the result shows a pretty high concentration of membranous particles. About 93% are positive for the membrane marker cell mask deep red. On the other hand, 21 and 19% of overall signals are positive for the corresponding markers CD81 and CD63 respectively. Tetraspanin 29, however, seems to be lower abundant compared to the previous mentioned, as only 3% of the overall particles could be identified as positive for CD9. But do I need a multilaser system to do multi-wavelength application? The good answer is no. But how is this feature working? Last year we released a new instrument add-on called the multi-filter feature. Here we take advantage of Stokes shifts with different wavelength units for certain fluorophores. In this example, we simultaneously labeled extracellular vesicles with two different tetraspanin markers. The anti-CD81 antibody is hereby coupled to the fluorophore Alexa Fluor 488, whereas the anti-CD63 is labeled with the tandem conjugate PECF594. Both dyes can be excited with a 488 nanometer blue excitation laser. The Alexa Fluor 488 has a short Stokes shift and emits light in the green wavelength area, whereas the PECF594 has a longer Stokes shift and emits light in the orange. By using the standard long pass filter set of the CW, it is impossible to distinguish between the two signals. But with the new multi filter feature, we use a combination of band pass and long pass filters to separate the emitted photons from the two dyes individually. For the previously mentioned dye combination, we use a 520 plus minus 25 nanometer bandpass filter, which transmits the photon from the Alexa Fluor 488, but effectively blocks the light from the PECF594. Furthermore, 
A long pass filter which opens around 600 nanometer is used for the detection of the tandem PECF594. It is understood that the carryover from one channel to the other channel needs to be taken into account. And like in flow cytometry, the spillover effect needs to be corrected. The use of single color controls has been proven to be very effective. After the spillover correction, the size distributions show the expected results. While the concentration in scatter mode reflects a total number of particles, or 100%, the signal in the two fluorescent channels show only the CD63 positives as 25 or the CD81 positive vesicles as 12.5% respectively. As already illustrated in earlier experiments, the particle size results show that the unlabeled, unspecific content of the sample has a huge impact on the size distribution. The scatter curve is much broader and the peak of the distribution is clearly shifted to larger numbers. The concentration on the CD63 and CD81 positive exosomes, however, show a sharper distribution and the peaks are moving into size ranges which are confirmed by electron microscopic analysis. But is the fluorescent nanoparticle tracking limited to surface markers? Or is it also possible to identify cytoplasmic proteins or exosomal cargo? As shown in this slide, we successfully identified nucleic acid containing vesicles in a commercially available EV preparation. Beside the membranous particles, we were able to detect DNA-RNA cargo by using DAPI. Since this dye can pass the membrane passively, a permeabilization step was not required. In the second part of this presentation, I would like to concentrate on the question how to improve the FNTA experiments. Basically, there are some general challenges that need to be addressed to obtain good results. The user-to-user -user variability needs to be minimized. In an internal lab study, we examined the user's experience on the repeatability of NTA results. To do so, three users did the same experiment. THP1-derived EVs were stained in triplicates with a fluorescently labeled monoclonal antibody. Each of the staining preparations was split in individual batches, diluted for FNTA, and measured multiple times on the CW quad. The measurement results of user A show a large variation, whereas the results become more and more consistent with the experience level of user B and user C. This finding is also reflected in the standard deviation values of the corresponding users, indicating that training of the user is an important factor of the experimental output. So we can summarize that experience significantly reduces result variability. The next challenge which needs to be overcome is the low signal-to-noise ratio of FNTA. But what does it mean? Staining with fluorescence means adding dye in excess, which in turn means a high amount of unbound dye. So it would be good to wash all the free dye away. But unfortunately, we are working with very small particles, so washing is a problem. It would cost us a lot of time and we would for sure lose a big portion of our particles of interest. The solution is optimizing the dye concentration in a way that in the final dilution the concentration of the dye is below the detection limit of the detection system. That means in most cases pre-dilution of the dye is highly recommended. In this example the unspecific membrane stain cell mass green requires a pre-dilution of 1 to 5. So we can ascertain that optimizing the antibody concentration will help to optimize the signal-to-noise ratio and therefore lower the detection limit. Challenge number three, low signals in general. In contrast to cells, the surface of extracellular vesicles is very small. The number of binding sites is rather limited, meaning that only a small number of fluorophores will be present on a particle. The easiest way to deal with this challenge is optimization of the staining procedure. This does not only refer to the adaptation of the antibody vesicle ratio, but also on the general antibody concentration, incubation time and incubation temperature as we can see here on this slide. As shown, successful dealing with low signals require a lot of adaptation. 
However, the use of bright and stable fluorophores is a matter of course and strongly affects the quality of the data. One of the most important challenges we need to address is bleaching of the dye. Depending on the chemical subclass, a dye shows more or less photostability. FITC and other fluorescein derivatives are known to be quite unstable and should be chosen with care. We at Particle Metrics invested a lot of resources in addressing this issue. Firstly, we developed a special hard and software feature which limits the destructive laser run sample time. This so-called low bleach function enhances the detectable signals by a factor of 5 in comparison with other NTA instruments. In case you have an ACW running on our old software version, please get in touch with us, we can easily upgrade your system. Secondly, and in addition to the low bleach function, our system works with a unique patented scanning technology. This means our optic is mounted on movable tables, allowing us to scan through the entire flow cell. During this process, the optic stops fully automated and takes videos from 11 independent positions. This makes very short exposure times possible and fresh unbleached sample is available for every measurement position. An additional unique advantage of the scanning technique is the multiplication of the sample volume by a factor of 11, which is roughly 400 times more than classical NTA systems without liquid transportation, resulting in very robust statistics. All in all, dye bleaching can be easily limited by the use of our low bleach functionality and scanning technology. Last but not least, there is only a small number of standard protocols available. Some of them are available on our website and some of them are already published by our collaborators. To speed up the development of FNTA protocols, we would be very happy to establish, optimize and publish those documents together with you. If you are interested, please get in touch with us. With this slide, I am at the end of my talk. I would like to take the chance to say a big thank you to our partners and collaborators. Thank you for providing samples and your scientific expertise. And finally, many thanks for your time, your attention and your interest in our nanoparticle tracking analyzer from the CW family. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. We are happy to discuss your application in detail. It's easy peasy.